joined today by uh, Ben Mitriou. I got that right? Yes, sir. Good. Um, from University of Minnesota, works on issues in ethics, including uh, uh, dignity and honor ethics and issues of race. And today we are going to hear about a framework for monument debates in post war Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Rafe. And thank you for uh, the block department here for uh, letting me come and share some of these ideas. I enjoyed um, traveling around Hong Kong and seeing the beautiful city. Um, I'm going to just give a framework for thinking about the ethics of uh, monument ethics as it pertains to sort of multi-racial or multicultural societies with old grievances. Um, there, you know, you can talk about monument ethics with regard to like, I don't know, sexism in monuments or something like that. We're going to focus on race and uh, like post-colonial uh, grievances. I'm going to give, a, this framework is neutral. I, I believe it's neutral. I think you could take different positions in this framework, but I, I'm going to lump for my positions on the framework and I'll briefly apply it to um, two types of post-colonial society. Uh, and so the framework has three dimensions, uh, this moralism versus sentimentalism um, dimension, what I call interpretive dominance versus interpretive independence dimension, universalism versus particularism dimension. And maybe you'll locate yourself in a different place than I do in, in this you know, uh, multidimensional space. All right, let's talk about this dimension, moralism versus sentimentalism. So for the moralist, um, the object of a memorial or the object of a statue or something monument uh, must be morally good. If it's a monument to a person, that, that person must be morally good. If it's a monument to some value, that value has to be a true value. It can't be people value or something like that. If it's a monument to war, it has to be people. Um, whereas um, on the other end of this uh, dimension is what I call sentimentalism which says that monuments to immoral people or for immoral causes are perfectly acceptable when they memorialize culture heroes, national struggles, or et cetera. The idea here is that um, we memorialize and we put up, up monuments, much like how we deck the analogy here as much as how we decorate our homes, all right? So, um, you know, you, it isn't like when you're putting up pictures in your home, or you know, putting up heirlooms in your home that you're too worried about whether or not that picture represents someone morally good or something morally good. It just there are many reasons, odd, quirky psychological reasons you might decorate as you do. So here's a, a picture of my living room, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, like the idea here is <clears throat> going to be best understood. If you think about your, not your house or my house, because you know we're just, I mean, maybe not, but most of us are just middle class or low probably, and we just moved into our house, like you know, Americans move every seven years, right? But imagine you inherited like a country manor, you're a country squire, you know, you had your that house has been your family for hundreds of years, right? That sort of um, the logic we would apply to how you maintain and treat this, you know, as a caretaker, this multi-generational home that you also pass over to your descendants, right? That's the sort of idea of sentimentalism. Okay, so, you know, you tweak around, you know, you may tweak it, you may change a couple things, but, you know, you also want to keep a lot of well, um, there. But again, it isn't as if you're like worried whether or not this figure was a good person or a bad person. Okay, so um, there really are moralists. Uh, mo probably most philosophers writing on this um, assume a sort of moralism. Helen Fro explicitly argues uh, for moralism. Helen Fro from the uh, University of Stockholm. Uh, so, for instance, she says, you know, a person's being a serious rights violator is a sufficient condition for a state's having a duty to remove a public statue of that person, she says. I argue that this applies. No less in the case of morally ambiguous wrongdoers who both accomplish significant goods and perpetuate serious rights violations. So to summarize from um, premise one, we should erect or maintain memorials only to figures whom we think it fitting to admire. Figures who engage in serious right violations are not fitting to admire. Um, so we should not erect or maintain public memorials to figures who engage in serious right violations. That's a 
very clear statement. I mean, these are my words, it's my summary of her, but um, I think it's fair. And, uh, you know, it's a very, she's the most clear open defender of Mullins. Um, she feels like the moralistic position is, one of her arguments for the moralistic position is because, well, she seems to argue like this is what she thinks we are tacitly guided by. Um, so for instance, she says that the historical record view, now the historical record view, she only sees, like she sees the contrast class for the moralist being someone who says, oh, monuments are to like maintain, like uh, to represent the history of it, okay? And she goes, well, if that's true, if like monuments are about history, then the dearth of public statues of say Hitler in Britain would be baffling. It's hard to imagine a more important historical figure in British history than Hitler, makes sense. Um, and yet the absence of such statues is far from baffling, rather, right? And then she gives her explanation, moralistic explanation. Rather, it is straightforwardly explained by the fact that we do not tend to build statues to people whom we believe engaged in serious wrongdoing, even if those wrongs were of monumental historical significance. Um, now, uh, if moralism is true, and if one of the reasons that you should be a moralist is because this is how people uh, memorialize, then it would be strange that we would have uh, monuments to Genghis Khan. <laughs> And, but yet the Mongolians are putting up many monuments to Genghis Khan since they've uh, sort of gotten their sort of independence from communism. Um, so uh, there's this huge nationalist sentiment in Mongolia, and they well, have latched on to Genghis Khan, and this is uh, a monument that was, uh, I think it was about 10 or so years ago. It was about 140 feet tall. Um, this is a little quote. Um, they're putting up monuments to Shaka Zulu. The British put up a monument, monument or two to Shaka Zulu themselves. The British love monuments, uh, but uh, those great Victorians. But um, uh, monuments are going up in uh, the Zulu areas of, you know, KwaZulu Natal in, in South Africa to Genghis Khan. I mean, to Shaka Zulu, who was, of course, himself a colonizer of the worst sort and you know drove out uh, millions and displayed and killed millions very personal like kind of personally responsible as much as Hitler is for uh incredible amounts of suffering okay no complaints whatsoever about the Shaka Zulu monuments and this is a new monument at Shaka Zulu International Airport okay um the only thing I could find criticizing this monument is that um, some people, some uh, Zulus think it looks too feminine. <laughs> so so uh, I, I don't want to hear moralist philosophers complaining about these monuments. Like, there should be no monument. You should take down this monument to Shaka Zulu, right? But no one, no one seems to care about the Shaka Zulu monument. All right. Um, so uh, when, when you poll British people about these monuments to slavers and so forth, um, most think that it is unfair to make judgments about people in the past based upon today's value statutes of people who were once celebrated should be allowed to stand, right? So if Rose moralism is true, um, because this is how people think and deal with monuments, then it's not really squaring with actual British public opinion. Um, so, you know, when she says things like the reason that we're not, it would be inappropriate to put up a new monument to Rhodes because, you know, he was a grand uh, colonialist. Um, you know, the important point here is that when there's broad consensus about a person's wrongdoing, the question of building a statue, that person does not arise, she says. But that's not true. We are putting up monuments still today to people who were not, you know, morally creditable people, for instance, in America. Um, there are new monuments going up to George Floyd. Okay, I don't know how much that has been in the news um, here, but um, you know, the um, after the the death of George Floyd in 2020, um, you know, some some informal and formal statues have, and monuments have gone up to George Floyd. Now, it isn't like George Floyd was a good person. I don't know, like a lot of people arguing that George Floyd was some. He, he, his George Floyd statue should go up because he was like some moral paragon. He was not. He was, you know, at, at best sort of par, but not really. I mean, he was a convicted home invader. Okay. 
like was part of a group of people who invaded, did a, a house invasion, armed robbery, held a gun to a woman, all right, posing as a water inspector, okay, who's not like a good person. Those monuments are not going up because anyone thinks George Floyd was a good person. Those monuments are going up because people were traumatized by his killing of uh, black by, by police, right? Which makes a lot more sense on a sentimentalist account, not a moralistic account. So if we look at um, these three views, a moralistic view, a historical record view, and what I call sentimentalism, I think we see sentimentalism explains actual monumentary practices better. Um, why is there no Hitler monument in Britain? Well, because moralism does do a good job explaining that. that right? um, the historical record view, as she correctly points out, doesn't explain why there's no Hitler monument in Britain. But sentimentalism does explain why there's no Hitler monument in Britain, namely, the British don't have any sentimental feelings about Hitler. <laughs> you know, it's not like. You know, um, so um, the uh, sentimentalist view does explain why there would be Churchill monuments in Britain, um, as with the historical record view. Depending on how you think about Churchill as a moral figure, you know, maybe Rose view does or doesn't. So. What about the Khan or Shaka monuments in their respective locales? Well, Thoreau's moralism doesn't explain that. The, these people were every bit as bad as anyone that Thoreau is complaining about, whereas sentiment, so sentimentalism does explain that. Of course, the Zulu people are proud of Shaka Zulu, even if they don't, even if they aren't necessarily proud of immorally, or Mongolians are proud of Khan, even if they're not, as it were, these important cultural figure, figure for them. I represent something that they're proud of, even if they don't think that he is, was morally good. Um, Elizabeth does a good job of explaining that, as we just described. Uh, and what about the Floyd Monument? Again, the sen sentimentalism doesn't make sense. You know, you you might, like my mother-in-law has a picture of her feed mill in the 60s going up in flames, right? Her family business going up in flames on her refrigerator. It was a very important moment in her life, a very traumatic time in her family's life, right? She's not celebrating as like a good thing that happened, but that's how we memorialize. We memorialize setbacks or you know, uh, you know, sad things that happen to us. It isn't that we think it was necessarily moral improvement. Okay, so, well, let's go back to this Hitler monument. Dan, are you saying that, you know, it's okay to put up a Hitler monument? Well, if you think it's okay to put up a monument to Shaka Zulu and to uh, Genghis Khan, then you cannot be opposed to a Hitler monument because of, on moral grounds, that, that Hitler was a bad person. Um, you, you need some other story about why it, should, it would be wrong to put up a Hitler monument. And I think um, there are reasons for that, right? So when you decorate your, when, when you're decorating your house, when you're making your house your home, not an Airbnb and not just some domicile to just like recover from working, um, there are lots of moral constraints on what you put up or what you don't put up. Like, so for instance, I wouldn't put up a big picture of an ex-girlfriend in my house, okay? Not because my ex-girlfriend is immoral, <laughs> okay? But because there are other people that live in my house, like my wife, who don't, you know, it would be immoral to, to do that because it would offend my wife. So I am an offense theorist about, like, I think one of the big guiding views about the morality of monuments is offense, all right? As is sometimes my, my sometimes debate uh, partner on this, Travis Timmerman, who's more removalist than preservation. But we're both, we agree on both being offense theorists, we're not moralists about it. So there's many interesting, complicated rules about like who you can and can't affect, right? Um, so, you know, are you worried about a Hitler monument because of who it's going to offend? Does it, would, would a, a Hitler monument in Germany, you know, wrongly offend Jewish or gypsy, um, you know, Germans, et cetera? Like that absolutely is still in play. Even okay, let's talk about the next dimension which I call interpretive dominance versus interpretive independence. So uh, just a little bit of lingo here to make things easier to talk about. 
let's say a disqualifying interpretation is an interpretation which, if it were the only good one, would render the monument unsuitable for installation or maintenance. And a um, uh, now, now uh, and a qualifying interpretation would, would be one that says, okay, yeah, under that interpretation, the monument's fine to uh, for it to be done. Now, lots of monuments have qualifying and disqualifying interpretations, right? So um, um, when you ask about, well, how do we respond to a monument? What I'll call interpretive dominance says this, if a monument has a reasonable disqualifying interpretation and a reasonable qualifying interpretation, policy should respond to the disqualifying. Interpretive independence says, if there's, a qual if there's a reasonable qualifying interpretation and a reasonable disqualifying interpretation, it's still an open question. So let me give you some. Suppose that a bunch of people go to the big Buddha like I did yesterday and they say, they say, what's that, what's that thing right there? That's a swastika. How dare you? How dare you put up a Nazi statue here in Hong Kong? You know, that, that we need to take down Nazi statues and so forth. Well, I think we all understand, you know, that the, the swastika has this, you know, grand long history across many um, cultures and it, it, it's not associated with um, Nazism here. Someone who would argue that the Buddha is a Nazi statue would, I don't think that's a, a reasonable disqualifying interpretation, but that would be a disqualifying interpretation. None is um, the University of Wisconsin Madison removed, uh, I think, like a 70 ton boulder that had been there, like that was a natural part of the landscape there. Um, could, it was of interesting geological significance. And somebody during the, the unrest in America a few years ago found out that in a campus newspaper, literally 100 years ago, someone called it an N-word head, an N-word head, I might have said word, but they called it an N-word head in this campus newspaper because evidently um, large black rocks generally were called N-word heads, okay? No one for generations has called it an N-word head. Nobody knew until this Arcania was discovered that it was ever called an N-word head, but it was publicized that this was called an N-word head. And because of that, uh, University of Madison spent all this money to remove the statue. Um, I think this is also kind of silly. I think that's an unreasonable disqualifying interpretation. You see how uh, hair trigger more reasonable are things like Confederate monuments where you could see that, okay, yes, there, there is more reasonable disqualifying and qualifying interpretation. So for instance, um, in, a, in a fairly recent poll uh, of North Carolinians, 75% felt that Confederate monuments honor Confederates who died. Reasonable qualifying interpretation. Yeah, no problem to have a monument up under that interpretation. Um, Half of Black North Carolinians actually hold that interpretation, by the way, at least at that time. And but 50% felt that they interpreted Confederate monuments as glorifying what the Confederacy fought for. That's a disqualifying interpretation. Um, and I think, you know, being careful of reasonable disqualifying interpretation, right? So these have qualifying interpretation, call reasonable qualifying interpretations, reasonable disqualifying interpretations. Now the question of policy is, if you're an interpretive independence theorist, like I, then it's an open question, right? If you're interpretive dominance, then no, you know, it has a reasonable disqualifying interpretation. I, I think that's a little extreme, but you may disagree about that. Now this is, um, was once inscribed in a monument in um, New Orleans called the Liberty, the Battle of Liberty Place, um, long story here about uh, there was a, a bit of unrest after the Civil War, and uh, this was inscribed in this monument, kind of simple monument. It's just a, it's just a column, but it said United States troops took over the state government and reinstated the usurpers 
but the national election in November 1876 recognized white supremacy in the South and gave us our state. So very clearly a monument to white supremacy. Um, hard to see that there's a reasonable qualifying interpretation on this one, right? So you, so even if you're an interpretive independence person like me, and you may not be, but if you're an interpretive independence person like me, then this statute would really be up for removal because it doesn't seem like there's going to be any reasonable qualifying interpretation for this one, but there's obviously very reasonable <laughs> disqualifying interpretations. Okay, third dimension, universalism versus particularism. So a universalist about monuments says, look, monuments need to be for the entire polity. Or if we're talking about a university, like if we're thinking about putting up a statue at Linan, um, you know, you would say, well, this, whatever statue we put up has to represent all the demographics of the university, right? Or all the values of the, the corporate values of the university as a whole. Or as opposed to, as opposed to the universalist, uh, or well, some examples that you might hear in discussions of monuments must represent our shared values or values that we should have, or monuments can't be to those who fought or rebelled against us, or monuments can't be to those who fought or hated or enslaved some of us, right? So that's uh, those are universalist means. So for, here are just examples in the in the public discourse of people uh, advancing universalist claims or making universalist assumptions. Um, this council member in New Orleans said. I know what it means to look up at those monuments to talk about Confederate monuments and feel less than, he said. Likening the city to a loving parent, he argued, uh, Jason Williams argued that no decent mother would memorialize one child harming the other, right? Because it's like uh, Mitch Landro again talking about New Orleans uh, Civil War monuments or Confederate monuments. Um, you know, these men did not fight for the United States, they fought against the United States. Um, they weren't patriots. Okay, so um, I, as opposed to um, the, I'll skip this, but opposed to the universalist, you could be a particularist. And the particularist says that there's nothing prima facie wrong about monuments that are for only one demographic in a multiracial, multicultural state, or memorialize events or causes that. Um, um, or memorialize positively events or causes that uh, other demographics inside your same polity condemn. Or even, uh, the particulars would even countenance monuments to those who fought against some others in the same country. Okay, so um, again, looking at actual practice, you see that this is like possible. So South Africa is one of the most, it's probably the most interesting place when it comes to monuments, democratic South Africa. Because they've been wrestling with this in a very smart way, we should talk about it in a bit. And so this is um, uh, the the, the uh, it, in um, Cape Town, uh, fort of a fort, uh, Cape of Good Hope Fort, or something like that. And um, I actually saw this. And uh, what what they did recently was put up in this um, fort that actually literally housed. Um, people who fought against the uh, African, uh, Africaners there. Um, they, they put up monuments to these people who were at one time or another um, actually jailed there. And what's interesting about these Africans um, is that they all were our culture heroes and leaders of uh, tribes that were opposed to each other. Okay, so it's like um, you know, like um, the Zulus displaced um, the uh, indigenous South African Khoisan people. Um, and, you know, like all these people fought against each other. Okay. And they're right, but their statues are right side by side. Okay. And everyone understands that. Everyone who goes there knows this. Right? Um, not universal. It doesn't represent everybody. It's not everyone cares about these people. Okay. The Zulus care about some of them, the Khoisan. Um, Other uh, examples, uh, this is at the Little Bighorn uh, Battlefield. Um, this was this monument to the Native Americans who, who massacred the, I think the um, seventh uh, 
division. Um, you know, this is celebrating Native Americans massacring Americans. Now, wait, Mitch Landro said they fought against America. You can't have a monument to people who fought against, well, why do, why do we have Native American monuments then who fought against America? And it wasn't like they were fighting for, you know, a multi multicultural liberal state. <laughs> These were ethno, ethno tribes, right? You know, fighting for ethnic homogeneity of their people and their land and territory. I'm not holding that against them at all, right? But let's not pretend that they were fighting for like some modern contemporary liberal values or something. Right, don't just celebrate. Crazy Horse. I mean, Crazy Horse helped kill Cut Custer and, and, and you know, massacre the mayor. And, and we have money. We were all okay with it. We missed it. Um, okay. In, in Norway, there's uh, this is pretty, this is pretty, I need to get Grant to go see this. Um, pretty cool, but they, they represent three important um, tribes in Norway that were united. And, um, you know, but all these people fight against each other. It's, it's absolutely psychologically possible. All right, so um, I myself am more on the particular side of things. I think it's okay to have monuments for certain groups for reasons we talk about today. But I do think that there are limits on how you do it. Like, again, because I'm a defense theorist, I think that the monuments to a particular group in your tribe as a word in your grand in your multi-racial or whatever tribe in your nation or whatever the polity is in question university whatever they can't be offensive and so even if we know that they fought against each other the monuments aesthetics are very important they can't be offensive so it would be wrong to like like okay so like the native americans did scalp all the you know people they killed all the all the soldiers they killed in fact they like mutilated their corpses they like off their generals and stuff. Oh, okay, all right. You should have a monument. You should have like a Native American monument with crazy horse stuff, being, you know, Custer's testicles in his mouth. You should not do that. Okay. Um, it's enough to represent crazy horse in some heroic pose, right? Honoring a Native American uh, citizens, right? And, and so forth. But it, it, it shouldn't be in a way that affects. Okay. All right. So let's look at some applications. Um, um, sometimes you have um, cases where the colonizing population is still there and welcome. Question mark, question mark, question mark. There you go. Let's show the world. I would include South Africa here, at least, you know, ostensibly, supposedly, like, you know, Afghan is still uh, to be there. That was at least Bella's view, and, uh, or like uh, white Canadians or. And then you have some cases where the colonizing population has left, like you know, mostly India. Um, this is like the Pan-African National Divide, but like you know, a lot of mostly the white colonialists in, like say, West Africa, East Africa left. Um, this is the South Carolinian state flag. So imagine that you were like a black nationalist and you wanted to have a black ethno state in the South. So let's like put like that for this thing. Like, I want the lights out, right? Um, so let's suppose you have that being politicist. Uh, there, there are three postures you could take. Let, I'm going to focus right now on this one, and then we'll talk about this. Uh, if we assume, as I think we should, that people and peoples have a prima facie right to memorialize their greats, their heroes, and their ancestors, then what do we do when we hate? the great heroes or ancestors of a people who are nonetheless putative tribes. Um, or at least if we hate what they were about. That's the point. Well, here are three options. We can um, give up that right if we feel like exercising that right is simply incompatible with the benefits of association and association is uh, worth it. So for instance, like, um, um, let's say that um, um, my and you know you you hate my ancestors i hate your ancestors and we want to stay together and so we just give up honoring our ancestors that's uh we can just say no it's it's too important we're going to continue to honor our ancestors but i understand doing so is too offensive to you so we have to break up or we can try this more difficult middle way and maintain and exercise the right to 
honor our ancestors, even though you hate them, and um, and memorialize them in ways that is conscientious about not being offensive to reasonable, otherwise willing tribes. Okay. Um, so to help guide our intuitions here, imagine that we have an interracial marriage. And, um, you know, one partner, uh, and, and let's say like their parents and grandparents were both opposed for racial reasons to the marriage. They didn't want them to get married or they'd be appalled that, you know, oh, you married a black person, you married a white person. Or whatever. But nonetheless, this couple has gotten together. This couple is married, right? What should guide this interracial couple when it comes to putting up pictures or decorating their home? Do you put up a picture of grandma who was, you know, really racist against, you know? Um, my, you know, um, my intuitions are these, you know, um, the partners should want each other to feel pride in their heritage. Uh, I don't want my wife to hate her. My ancestors no longer hate her parents or grandma. I don't want my kids to love their grandparents. Um, this desire would be a prerequisite for each partner. Neither would agree to marry or stay married to a partner that wished anything different. I mean, that's just me. That may not be you. Okay, but I'm like me. I'm all, all obviously I'm giving some old school memes here about like you marry the family. I'm kind of being well, realistic here, but you know, you kind of marry the family. If I, if I, if I really love Jill, but I couldn't be with Jill if she kept talking to her parents or would bring my kids to her parents or I couldn't go to Thanksgiving at her house or something like that, then I'd have to bring these opportunities. If the partners had or have relatives or ancestors who disapproved of their relationship or tried to sabotage it, they would still we would still put their pictures up, not only for personal sentimental reasons, which include gratitude and desire to honor, but um, for the sake of the children so that they know who they are and where they come from. So they have some spike there. Continuity of the past and feel pride in there. Um, nonetheless, the interracial couple, I'm thinking, this is how I would do it, would pure, and, and by the way, it's not that hypothetical in my case. Now, I, I'm not in, well, depending on how you consider it, an interracial order. My, my wife is a Norwegian uh, American Farm girl, okay. I'm a Greek, uh, Greek. I come from Greek immigrant stock, um, and I'm fairly confident that her grandparents uh, would be quite opposed to to her marrying. Okay, I mean, her grandparents were not happy that um, that my wife's mother married, uh, uh, you know, like like the Catholic Lutheran. Division was too much for them. Um, let alone this, so they would have been. They would have been opposed if you told them in the future, all your granddaughter is going to marry a Greek immigrant. That would be appalled. Nonetheless, their pictures hang on my wall, and I want them up there on, on the wall. I'm not, I don't really opposed to them. If one part now suppose one partner most lost most of their family pictures in a fire. Um, then, then the other partner should be really alert to ways to help get more heirlooms and you know any way you can to get pictures up. Now that this is more like the case in the South Africa situation where there aren't a lot of monument supplies or weren't when it's democratizing. Or in America where there weren't a lot of monuments when there was up to up areas, right? There's a they're not like represented on the national landscape as much as they should be. So we need to do some remediation there. And that is, um, you know, like, like, so for instance, by this logic, um, if I were like, if I were black and I were married to a, a white uh, woman whose ancestor was Robert E. Lee, I would be more okay with her putting up a picture to Robert E. Lee in my house than some sort of just race, racist tchotchke that she found at a garage sale. Right, that doesn't have a lot of meaning. That isn't really like bolstering the, you know, pride and, and that the family has in its history and so forth. This, this is a meaningless thing, offensive uh, aesthetically and so forth. This is not offensive aesthetically. 
look, who did more what who did more harm to black people? Uh, Robert E. Lee or the minstrel shows, obviously black people, but we're not moralists here, right? We're not that's not what that's not what's guiding. That's just my position. Obviously. Um, my position is uh, pretty much, I think, the most philosophically articulated version of uh, Mandela's approach in, in South Africa. So um, when South Africa was about to democratize, there were all there were all these newspaper articles about, oh man, once once the blacks are in charge, they're just going to tear down all these Afrikaner monuments. And uh, Mandela made it very clear that they would not, okay, <laughs> do, do so. And so those monuments stayed up, like almost all of them. And even today, uh, most of them are still up. And you go to uh, like the Union buildings, uh, Africa has them, I'm sorry, a couple of them in the capital. But the Union buildings are one of them. And um, you know, you could see like major Afrikaners monuments still there, right next to monuments like Mandela. Right, right there on the ground. Yeah, they're all over the place. So the Mandela policy, as I'm going to call it, is if you're trying to keep a multiracial post-colonialist former slaveholding society together, you keep most monuments up. You take down maybe ones that are aesthetically highly offensive. Um, and you add new ones to the underrepresented group. And you, you just kind of keep the new ones positive. You just sort of you, 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 you don't yeah, put up offensive monuments. Uh, so this is an example, like, you know, people were kind of surprised that this is taken from like 1994, um, LA Times, I think. So people were kind of surprised about the Mandela's feelings. And he said, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're enemies to some of us, but they're heroes of the white South Africans. They're the white South Africans are part of our people, they're part of our family. You know, we're going to keep this one. So. And so you see, it's all over the place. Here's the Boer Trekker monument that celebrates when the the um, Boers uh, left uh, before the British were starting to control um, uh, South Africa, and they moved up into more of the interior. And uh, it celebrates their fighting the Zulus, and it has some pretty spicy uh, murals in there and, and, and relief sculptures um, that would be, you know, how to celebrate the Boers defending themselves and killing um, Zulus. Still up there, okay? Um, and uh, what they did was on the next hill over, uh, made a new uh, thing they call Freedom Park, a new, like, experiential monument um, called Freedom Park that celebrates the emancipation of Blacks. You know, you know. And there's like a path called, I think, like Reconciliation Row or Freedom Path or something that connects the two. Um, I already showed you this one. Um, here was a long-standing, so this is in Durban, a statue of both uh, They did not take it down, but they put up a monument to bring Zulu and Zulu to the next door. Adam, not Okay, um, well, what about in cases where the colonizing population um, has removed themselves or are not welcome anymore? Okay, um, in that case, well, kind of do what you want. I mean, <laughs> if you're not interested in in having that population as tribe mates, or if they they weren't interested in you as tribe mates, and they've like left. Um, then, you know, what you want. Uh, like, I mean, if I buy a house and for some reason the people have left up the decorations, well, I'm going to take down the decorations and put up, you know, I don't know, their family members don't remain with me. I'm going to put up just my family members. Now, there are exceptions. What if um, they have some really cool vase? You know, I'm going to leave that vase. <laughs> Aesthetically, like it doesn't mean anything to me or it doesn't mean the same thing that meant to them. But I like the vase, so I'm going to leave that vase there. It kind of looks good, right? Um, so you may keep them for aesthetic reasons. Let's say um, India wants to keep good relations with Britain. They may leave up monuments, just not alienate Britain. So Britain's continue to, you know, use good political allies, maybe, or they want British tourism, so they may want to leave it up. Um, 
you may you may interpret you may want to monument up because it is of historical value to you like it, it it's um you know you, you may just reinterpret it that way you know so it's not celebratory uh it is uh, it goes from being a celebratory monument of the colonizers colonizing you to a monument of mourning of, of your being colonized or you may leave it up because it's like, ha ha, there's your monument, but now it's in our location. We're going to put a big Indian flag on it. And now it's like a trophy to our overcoming. You. Like, those are all things that people do. Okay. Like, I mean, they were like these generals that conquered Napoleon, they had busts of Napoleon up in their homes. It was because they loved Napoleon. Mm -hmm. They looted some Napoleon bust and brought them back. They're like, you know, it's, it's travel. Or you could take them down. Um, so, you know, just like if there's a divorce, you may, you may take down pictures of your wife or think heirlooms are important to your wife or family or something like that, um, so forth. So, and, and, you know, India has been doing this. If they take some down, they leave some up, they congregate them in certain areas so you can visit them and so forth. Many options. And uh, so, so, yeah, that's it. That's, that's the view. And uh, thank you for uh, showing up and I'm interested in what you have to say. Okay, start a few show of hands. So we'll start with uh, uh, Jesse. Um, no, not a lot of questions. Um, so, yeah, in the first third of your talk, this moralism, sentimentalism stuff, you described the moralism to you in very like descriptive terms. And your examples against it were about people's like beliefs about these monuments. And like I agree with you about all that, but I I would think like these moralists are really like activists, and they're not making is claims; they're making ought claims. They're saying we ought to remove or destroy um, these monuments if they're offensive. So I wonder if there's you're kind of like yeah. missing that in right. your discussion, and I'm also curious that like you're into the um, Offense too as a kind of moral reason. Yeah. But why should we care about offense? Why is offense important? Um, you know, like it's not that long ago the interracial marriage was offensive. It, we thought, most people thought gay marriage was offensive. People thought Jewish persons were offensive, but they were all wrong. Why shouldn't we focus on like harm instead of offense? Great. So um I thank you for asking a question about uh about the descriptive versus prescriptive. Like, why am I bringing up the um, public opinion or discord practices around these monuments when the whole question is what should be done about these monuments? Here's what. Here's why Fro does too. All right. So why does Fro bring up as part of as as evidence for her moralism that we don't have any statues up to him? Right, so she's she's doing it too, right? So why why is she doing it? I think she's right. Um, because you can't talk about the morality of monuments without talking about the function of monuments. So, for instance, suppose I put up a poster. You you sound like you're American, so you know what uh, the America's most wanted is, right? It's like the worst criminals in America that we can't find. You know, America's most wanted. They put up posters. Um, so suppose up, suppose we put you know America's most wanted poster up, and you're like, how dare you? How dare you put this poster up of these? Do you understand these are bad people? <laughs> you're not so right. Like you'd be like, well, of course they're bad people. This is an America's most wanted poster. That's that's what this poster is about. It's not like celebrating them. The whole point is that you just can find them, right? They're not supposed to be good people. Get it? The function of that poster is to put up bad people, not good people. Right? So the, the, the function of mon the function of something matters to the morality of, of putting it up. The function of a representation matters to the morality of that representation. Okay. So if monuments have the function of being for good people, then a monument to a bad person. Would be a moral put up. 
But if monuments have a different function, kind of like halfway in between here, or just totally orthogonal to celebrating good people and America's most wanted, then um, that matters, right? And so my claim, that's why I talk about, all right, like the, the dispute here is what the functions of monuments and memorials uh, is. She's, she, I think, exaggerates the, the you know, she, she sees it as, as more celebratory and not the, it, well, as moralistic than, than I do. And so, like, if we didn't know, like, if there were just a bunch of America's most wanted posters up, like, we didn't speak the language and we were just trying to figure out, like, you know, like, you know, we'd have to talk about, like, well, what is, the, what are these posters for? Where are they functioning right now? And that's why this, the descriptive the description matters. So, how are people treating these, these, these people up? On, oh, they're hunting them? Oh, okay. So, it isn't like about celebrating them as good people. It's like actually, the bad people. So, so we have to look at how people are using these monuments in real life to figure out what their function is. And we need to look at actual practice to figure out what the function is. I think the sentimentalist account does a better job of accounting for the actual practices around memorialization than moralist does. Now about offense. Um, so it, a, a, good, a, a, a good consistent moralist would be against a monument to an evil person, even if no one was offended by it. Right now, I um, I'm so so um, I'm an I am an offense theorist. Um, now, for um, I, I think I think offense is morally relevant to memorialization um, because. I, I just think it's morally wrong to put up monuments that are offensive to, well, let's go to that, the domestic analogy that I keep drawing on, right? It would be immoral to put up to put up pictures on your wall that are offensive to your wife, or your spouse, or your kids, or something like that. Um, so there's this, it, 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 it isn't that it's wrong to offend. Now, my, 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 I sometimes debate Travis Timmerman on this point, and he th he thinks offense is harmful. There's a prima facie, then premise two, there's a prima facie, it's a prima facie wrong to harm. So therefore it's a prima facie wrong to have offensive monuments. And and I I I I'm more qualified than he is on this. I think that what matters is who you're offending. Um so I'm okay with and I I have a new data coming in now this but I'm okay with the thing, like it's okay to have artwork in your house that will offend someone who's not in your house. <laughs> so um, it isn't just raw offense. Uh, it, it has to be the, the people offended have to have some claim to not be for it to be wrong to offend. And I think people are our fellow countrymen do have a claim on us not to be offended you know, by, by, by the household decorations. Uh, so, so that's why it does matter. So like in the original Star Trek, Kirk kisses the Burra, the first white man kissing the black woman, which is the many, many people, perhaps most Americans found that deeply offensive. Um, yet it came on public television. I think that was a good thing you think that's a wrong thing that shouldn't happen? Uh, no, I, my, my view is totally orthogonal to that because you haven't given me a story about whether or not anyone had a claim to not being offended. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't see any claim there to, you know, so you could be kind of libertarian about it and be like, well, if you're offended by that show, change the channel, right? There, you know, when people say that, what they're saying is, Yes, it's offensive to you, but you have no cl moral claim to being not offended by that kiss, um, right? So, yeah, my views, are, my views, are totally compatible with it being okay. To, you know, I, I'm a, Travis would be more in trouble with that uh, example than I would. Um, so, um, but I do think Black Americans, as our co-nationals, as my co-nationals, right, American co-nationals. Um, maybe not, not, not everyone's question. Um, do have a claim um, to, to, to have monuments that are not offensive. 
to them. Just like people in our house have the, the claim to not have declarations of the house that are the I'm not saying it's totally settles the issue. I'm not saying that the most sensitive person or a very small minority being offended settles the issue or anything, but discussion has not started. Um, Chinese do oh, fish. <laughs> Chinese do not have a claim on Mongolia's heritage. Uh, and so if you know, do they are they very happy about there being a lot of Genghis Khan monuments? Probably not. But they have you know, so they may be highly offended at it, you know, if they look at the binoculars over the border and see these Genghis Khan monuments. They don't have a claim to Mongolia's heritage landscape. So their offense doesn't to me matter. Um you know, but you know, that's a subsequent you know, history. Uh, but you know, um, you know, like because yeah, they're not in, they're not, they're not part of the group for whom um, monuments are for, which is for I'm kind of nationalist about this. Uh, rather than area. Yeah, I'd like to make sure I understand how the different positions are related to one another. So maybe close up on uh, what Jesse was. Asking about, um, are you as an offense theorist a kind of sentimentalist? Is that how I I'm, I'm a sentimentalist? Yes. Um, okay, I see. Um, and, um, but just because you're a sentimentalist, again, doesn't mean that you don't think there are moral constraints no, no, on no, how no. you de ter culturally terraform your landscape. And one of the constraints is that, I, um, as an offense theorist, is that you shouldn't offend certain people, namely your own demographics, <laughs> your own people. Um, so, um, oh, or the people you live with. Yeah, 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 yeah they're, they're not kind of, your people in a sense, but the people you live with. In the same well, yeah, family. you're co-national, like, yeah, you know, in this yeah. larger family, this yeah, more racial yeah. family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, um, you know, monuments to whites in America, uh, white Southern whites, um, it should not be offensive to blacks who they are co, you know, co-nationals. Doesn't it at all matter how these people came to live together? Because of course there's this analogy with the marriage, but normally a marriage is, let's say, ideally based on love. And so people are willing to make a sacrifice for one another. But what if the people just happen to live together for reasons? Not of their own choosing, and so on. No, no. Is no. It, does no. the analogy still work? Right. So this is why this matters here. <clears throat> yeah. If um, if we find ourselves stuck, or we find ourselves together. And we didn't necessarily want to be together. <laughs> then, then we have the hard choices to make. Um, if uh, you know, we have to decide: do we want to stay? Do we want to marry volitionally or not? Um, and if we want to get married, um, do we have to sort of like? Uh, renounce our histories in order to do that, or does one partner have to renounce their histories? So, here's what I don't like, though. I don't like a partner saying, I can't stand you, and I'm going to tell you how to decorate the house. <laughs> like, if you don't if if you're only with me because of the money I bring, then let, like let, then we should get divorced. I mean that's my view. Like let, let we should have a national divorce if, if you're only with me for the money or convenience or safety or something like that. Unless you bring something to the table that I find worth it to stay with you, you know, even though I'm going to have to reject and hate my people and so forth. You know, if, if that's where it's at, if that's where it's at. But um, I think you lose your claim. Go back to that earlier discussion. I think you lose your claim on me to worry about offending you 
if you don't even really want to be with me. Okay, you only have that claim for me to worry about offending you if you really want to be with me. Um, so um, the, these are this monuments debate can, in my view, cannot be totally extricated from deeper considerations about you know what is you know, the national character, you know, why, what is this, you know, sort of racial contract? What's the, what's the sort of, what sort of uh, polity are, are we doing? Um, and, you know, so if, 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 you know, my, I'm kind of uh, tribalistic about this, nationalist about this. I think if, I think if um, you can't, if I can't, if I can't celebrate my ancestors in, in, in a conscientious way, um, because you hate them so much, then, then you should have a then you should have a place. And okay, so, so literally they should be like uh, different African states or whatever. You know, split, split up the country. Yeah, that's a bigger it's, it's, it's something like if you want if you want to be together, but what if you've got no choice? You're forced to be together. Um surely you shouldn't, you know, surely a lot of the stuff you said about offense still applies if you got two communities that are forced. To live in the same space, even if they prefer the other community to go somewhere else. Yeah, um, I think that I think it would matter who's doing the forcing. Um, so, like, if it were some like, so if there's an empire forcing us to together, like, if you know, if, if the if the government forced you and me to be together, we both hate each other, we both hated our ancestors, you, you know, we hate each other's ancestors, um, then. Um, then what, like, why should I, I need to hear a story. Is it, is it just like ameliorative, like, well, this sucks already, let's not make it worse by putting up pictures to our ancestors that just piss each other off? Or, you know, like, why can't we just, why can't I have half the house and you have half the house and we decorate our, our separate rooms according to our preferences and you don't have to look at my side and have to look at yours, um, you know? Um, I mean, it's just simple. Not, we have to get along, right? So but we're living in the same kind of space, right? We have to somehow have an arrangement that, you know, um, is reasonably fair and reasonable and doesn't cause too much unfair uh, offense the other other side. So, so um, I think, I mean, I, I can see a lot of consideration you're giving just applies to the situation, even though these two communities would prefer the other community not to be there. But they live in reality. The reality is they are there. They're not, um, and so yeah. So the communities have to get along. Yeah, but why should they continue to be together? Because well, there, there might be nowhere else to go. I mean, like, they're, they're, like, like, I mean, maybe historical examples. You've got two two ethnic groups, right, in a in a in a, you know, in a space, right, and they and. Um, they both have a right to stay. It's very really costly for them to, for various reasons, for one of the communities to leave. Um, so yeah, that's a sort of, that's a example of the sort of situation. Yeah. Then I, you know, I think we just have to weigh. Like, if I, like, suppose I was really poor, and I met a woman who was rich and she was willing to marry me, but she hated my ancestors and didn't want any, you know, pictures of my family up on the walls and so forth. I might make a hard choice to be like okay you know whatever i need you know i gotta eat and i'm basically you know a gigolo here and, you know so okay it's all your pictures of your family and i'm just going to be here uh and i will you know renounce my people and so forth in order for the the benefit the material benefits of being with you at this point um fine um it's not the choice i would make it's not the choice I think any self-respecting ethnicity would make. Uh, it may be costly to separate, but it's, uh, you know, as opposed to what? Like just disappearing culturally or just uh, hating, hating your past and history? That's too high a cost for me. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, we shouldn't. Um, but again, People will differ. Some people will say, "Yeah, uh, that stuff just doesn't mean a lot to me. It shouldn't mean a lot to uh, a people or an ethnicity, and they should just do what is best materially, which which might mean, you know, 
Uh, and now we'll save all the characters. Gary. Thanks. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to follow up on what Jesse was saying. I wasn't quite sure I understood your response there. So, uh, that's an example of about the black white case on, on television. You seem to suggest there was a disanalogy there that maybe people don't have a right not to be offended by right. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So, do you think, all right, so here are two simple, simple views. V1. Dan offended, what's your name? Gary. Gary. Dan offended Gary. Prima facie, Dan did something wrong. Right? View number two, Dan offended Gary. Open question what Dan did anything wrong. Okay. I'm I'm a view number two. All right. I think I need to hear more about wait, does Gary have some claim on Dan for Dan not to offend? Right. So now with the so is the interracial kiss offensive to a lot of people? Yes, in 1960 order. Um totally open question to me about whether or not it, it would that it was even prima facie with that, because I don't know that anyone had some claim not to be offended by that. Okay, but right. Um so <clears throat> right. So what I what I do is I do supply a criterion. For having claimed not to be offended. I don't think it's, and, and that claim is that, well, you as somebody in my house, or you as someone who's part of my nation, so forth, should not decorate the national landscape in a way that's offensive to me and my people. Okay. Uh, modulo all those qualifications I have about interpretive dominance, that's what that's something. So, however, if you're not in my family, if you're not in my house, you're not in my nation, then um, you're putting up an offensive statue um, uh, that, that, or sorry, a statue that offends me and my people. Um, this is perfectly fine because you know, there's no, uh, I have no claim. And that's the game's comments in China. And there are lots of these cases. So, well, people kind of sell, you know, like Reefs will put up a picture of, you know, put up a statue like Leonidas or something like that. I'm sure, you know, uh, Iranians and Persians are like, oh, you know, fuck Leonidas, you know, and it's like, well, you know, you don't have a claim on, on you know, like, put up, put up Xerxes on, you know, in Iran and so forth. The Greeks have no claim to that. Okay, so I think if I understand then the idea is, um, Okay, Confederate statue in the town square, bad type of claim not to be offended as a black citizen. Yeah, no, it depends, right? Like, again, because that's why all that stuff about, like, <clears throat> if it's, um, you know, what are the aesthetics of it? Are you, are you offended because there is an interpretation that's offensive and you're not at all considering the interpretation that's not offensive, right? Right. So, you know, so, you know, that's where that stuff comes in. We can't, we can't be on a hair trigger where like any, any like uncharitable interpretation or just the mere person at all being represented is offensive because then again, that just undoes the whole thing. Then it's like, they can't, they can't honor their people. So you have to be okay with the, with, you know, just like, you know, like, um, you know, white Americans have to be okay with the Indian Memorial thing, even though it's obviously just for the Native Americans, really. It is obviously fighting. I mean, like, you know, like, here I am, uh, you know, someone might be a citizen of, you know, Wyoming or whatever. <laughs> They're like, well, I'm here, you know, obviously the people fought against that, right? But I, it's okay, you know, you're not showing, you're not, you're, you're not, again, but it's done in a way that does celebrate your people, does celebrate their heroism, their, uh, you know, agency without deliberately, you know, trying to offend my people. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, there's space for both. Yeah. That, that's, I think, the best way to do it. Did I miss any hands for the first round? Okay, I'll, I'll go to the question and we'll do second, second round of questions. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, 
kind of following up on both what uh, Dan and Beth asked um, about how essential the analogy with the household is, because, um, yeah, I guess, like, again, it's just being, I, I think of the relationship between people in a nation as very different than the relationship between family members in a household. And, like, one particular way in which they seem different is, like, um, uh, I should be willing to allow, like if I'm uh, living with my sister and she can do something that will make me like a little bit worse off to make her way better off. Well, I love her and I'm like, I don't just, I don't just want to let, get along with her. I wish her well. And so it's like out of love, um, I'm willing to make small sacrifices for big benefits for her. But it feels like we don't normally have that kind of relationship with other people in the same country, like, um, like, I'm, people can't harm me to benefit themselves greatly. I mean, I, I, and it seems like it's demanding too much of me as a citizen to say, oh, you should really care about your fellow citizens, so you should be willing to, like, I don't know, uh, uh, let them, let them hurt you in little ways to make, them, to make themselves really happy, or something like that. So it feels like, it just feels like in a family, there's special reasons to not just want to get along and not just to avoid hurting each other, but to like boost each other up. Whereas it seems to me at least, that like um, prima facie, that's demanding too much of citizens in the same country. Like their main job is to get along and not step on each other's toes and not infringe each other's rights, not to positively boost each other's self-esteem or something like that. And so that makes me feel like, yeah, in the household case, I want to say something like three. But in the state case, where our obligations to each other are less, I feel like maybe the demands of being in a polity, a political organization, as opposed to a family, are more in keeping with like one rather than three, even though that is also a revisionist right. view. Good. So this makes me happy that at least I'm providing a framework that's helping you think about this stuff and place yourself and see our differences. Um, and definitely one of the differences that will show up are, are these other commitments that we have and conceptions of nationhood and so on. And, and what wasn't being talked enough about in these monuments debate is how, how much these other commitments matter to this question. So, so the first thing I want to say is, okay, yeah, I mean, if we have different views about nationhood, then we're going to, that will have impacts on, on, on monuments. Uh, the second, sorry, right, then let me defend like a little bit, right? So, you know, it's like equal, equality, you know, and fraternity, and so liberty, fraternity, right? This, I, this idea, it's, this idea is out there um, in even, you know, the Western tradition about, well, we are co-nationals should have a sense of fraternity and brotherhood. Um, Rawls also lumps for it. Um, Rawls even makes the family analogy where he says that actually if we're in a family we do want those who are worse off to be better off even at a cost to ourselves it makes that pretty explicit when you if you expect progressive taxation to happen you want the rich to help pay for the poor those are two demographics and obviously the poor are getting way better if you deal with the rich um when you look at uh racially we we often ask it's very common to ask some racial demographics to make sacrifices to greatly improve other race racial demographics. For instance, for new action obviously harms Asian Americans and white Americans to the benefit of Black Americans. Right? Everyone knows this, right? The moral question is: Is that okay? And a lot of them like, yeah, it is okay, right? And because you know, they're whatever you know, there's a story about. It. And, and there's a fraternity argument about that. I think you get to that too, right? Well, there, there are people we need to you know, help them out with their time or something to get them online and get them part of the American community and represented in all the different strata. Um, I'm not saying uh, for or against for action, but I'm saying there's precedent here of, of some groups making sacrifices to greatly help other demographics. Um, we have an army. <laughs> And uh, those are huge sacrifices. We say, you know, they made the greatest sacrifice. You know, they, you know, they sacrificed for us. And um, 
And, uh, you know, so if we can, like, call young men out to go to war to defend their, their group, that places a huge burden on them for, to help the rest of us, right? So, um, you know, I think we do expect that from the nation. We do expect some of our people to make sacrifices for others that we don't expect, you know, someone on the other side of the earth to, to, to make for us. Okay, second round of questions. Justice Adam Owen. Okay, Justice Sarah Um At the end of your talk, you talked about the different like kinds of countries and for the ones that were like colonized, but the colonizer, colonizers are gone or unwanted. You kind of said like that, ah, they can do whatever they want for these statues that are left behind. You talked about how they could be removed. They could be kind of like mocked with like a flag or the flag or they could like change the meaning of them but i'm wondering what you think about destroying or vandalizing statues uh, where they like really disfigure it or completely destroy it not only in those colonizing not only in that kind of case but in the other case too um, i would think that would cause a lot of offense um what do you think about those kinds of that's I, thank you for asking a question because um the the, the there are philosophers uh I forget how to pronounce the term thing years later, but have, have actually argued for defacing, not just taking down to their minds, defacing, which I think is the most inadvisable possible position to take. Um not only like removing it would be bad enough, but actually deliberately offending um people who Identify with these statues as uh, extremely harmful for national community. Um, and uh, it has the, the removal of statues already, the wave of removals since 2015 has already galvanized uh, a lot of America and you know, moved them, you know, just really harm racial relations and really radicalized people. Um, although they have no political power to stop it right now. But it's, it's known and remembered discussed so um but i think if uh you really don't want that group there it's a smart strategy right because um again like if i if i if i right so here's here's a weird view i think i literally think at this point that monuments and memorials like like um the little physical objects are a social technology, right? It's a technology, much like a, all right, so, so you know how like that on, on, on borders, you sometimes, you know, if there's a peaceful border, you don't have a wall, you, you just have like, a, the people put up a big, like, you know, like a obelisk or something like that, but this the border in Scotland and Iran or something like that, it was just border markers, that's a bit of social technology. So, you know, obviously you could walk right across, but it, it, it's a symbol that this is where America deals with Canada. Um, well, monuments are a bit of a social technology too, in a sense. Um, it's really good. And, and it's interesting that advanced civilizations are big monument people. Um, because if I put up a monument to my values or to my people and you rip it down, that tells me about who my enemies are. It tells me about the future of those values or that those values are now under question or my people's presence here is now in doubt, right? So it's, it's a great canary in the coal mine. Um, the canary dies right before I die, right? Because they're more sensitive to whatever carbon monoxide or whatever than, than humans. Let, that, let me put up monuments and see if you take them down. If you don't, that means the values of those monuments or that I'm safe with the monument that's sort of represented by people. But if you take them down, then I know I'm next, right? So defacing monuments or taking them down is really great for terrifying people uh, that, okay, cleansing is about to happen or some religious cleansing is about to happen. So put them up. <laughs> but if you want them out, I mean, just uh, not talking more, but just pure practicality, if you want people out, then yeah, attack your monuments first, you know, because then they're going to get the message and and maybe run away, leave, or but understand that it's costly. It may also mean that they 
you know, start taking up arms and want to fight for the land. Right? It's a very high risk, high reward proposition. But, um, you know, um, if they, you know, if they left peacefully already or something like that, in the case of the British in India, then, you know, yeah, I mean, you should, you should, it's your land, it's your land, you should terraform it as, as the natives. Um, which may be the facing and so forth. Of course, that's costly because the facing of British monument, even in pre India, will still offend the British people, and that has consequences. Uh, and I, I think we should be very careful about who we offend. But I'm not against, again, again, I have this new paper that I'm arguing that it could be smart to deliberately offend uh, other groups um, for a bunch of reasons. Like it, it may build cohesion in my. In my nation, let me give you an example. Oh, who, who is it? USC or no? Yeah, USC UCLA has a rivalry. Do you know that? Yeah. And there used to be a fountain at UCLA, I think, that was called Finger Fountain. Do you know this? You can tell that I don't have a fraternity. Okay. So there, there used to be a a, a fountain at at UCLA. Oh, that was flipping off USC. That yeah, that kind of could be, and it wasn't really. It just happens to kind of look like a, a big hand giving a finger, and it kind of is in the direction of USC. <laughs> okay, and the kids called it Finger Fountain. So the kids at least interpreted this perfectly innocuous, not in an offensive way. Okay, no, I'm totally okay with this. I think that's great. All right, because it's it's. Does it maybe does it offend USC people? Sure, but who cares? Right, you're UCLA, right? And, the, and it helps build cohesion around UCLA, and they, you know they could they could um, enjoy this and find it to be you know transgressive in some way, and it could it could be fun, it could be good fun and morale building for UCLA, right? So there are cases where I think deliberately causing offense to an out group could be beneficial to the in group. And um, again, unless that outgroup has some moral claim to not, I don't think, you know, all respect to USC, I don't think they have any claim to the, you know, UC, UCLA not being offensive to USC. I mean, it's just it's worthwhile in the that's right? And certainly people shout from, you know, all sorts of, you know, that's sports. It's all about this, right? You know, being insulting and talking down the other team while you know to help build cohesion your team and it's you know activating all this fun tribalistic stuff in some good hearted way right so so um it, it is with it i absolutely do see a space of moral possibility where where you are deliberately offending out group by the face of mind next to them. so like in alabama i think it was a jefferson davis <laughs> statue of him sitting in a chair and they removed and destroyed Davis and turned the chair into a toilet. Mm. Yeah, say that's not bad. Um, it depends what your goals are. <laughs> like, if your goals are to um, alienate Southern whites and make them feel unwelcome, to send a message that you're taking the country over or something like that, and it's very smart. It's about the best thing you could do. Or if you want to start. You want to heat up social discord because you think you're going to win the result, you know, in the result, then yeah, that's a very smart thing to do. Um, um, if you want to start a civil war uh, or you want to avoid the civil war by just scaring away the group, then you should attack their monuments before you attack them in person. Right? Uh, so, you know, you should do it. But if you're trying to build goodwill with Southern whites or build a future with Southern whites, it's a very, very dumb thing. Um, and so, you know, that's what policymakers need to be thinking about when they let this sort of stuff happen. Uh, we've got uh, Dan and then Raph, and we've got uh, about, uh, about four minutes for each question. Oh, Dan. Okay, so uh, or maybe one of both of those were fingers, or what's the new? Oh, those were the <laughs> Okay. So, 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 yeah, this is an opportunity to give the question I gave you before. So, this is like, I'm still not sure why. So you're kind of privileging co-national versus like the national grouping, but it seems like there's again yeah, different communities. You just gave an example of a you know community. Of the UCLA, UCLA. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it seems like the same kind of point that 
by the various different communities. Um, and so there's nothing privileged about the, particularly privileged about the nation state uh, community. Um, and then also like between, even if, you know, maybe between communities, even if it's a you know, bigger community, there's still kind of levels of in interaction between those two communities. So tourism, for example, so like, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't, you know, you might think it's bad to put up monuments, you know, being nice, attacking like tourists while also wanting to come mm -hmm. and having a good relationship with it. So, so, so they, they, they put up those, those three options, you have these three different options, but it seemed like, like, yeah, no matter what sort of grouping we're talking about or in relation, you can still have these three, op three options. So even if it's two completely different communities, you have the option to kind of decouple, right? like China and, you know, the US economically at the moment. So, so it, 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 that, that would be one of those three options, right? So, so yeah, so I, I guess the question was, is it really, the nation state, is that such an important yeah, I, um, unit? I think if we're talking about national monuments, then, right, or public monuments, then it is, like, that's the salient group. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about sports teams, then you know, they did you know, changes to your campus versus my campus, or you know, Ohio versus Pennsylvania. So I, I think, yeah, I think when we're, if we're talking monuments, it seems like the debate is on the level of you know the nation and and so forth. Right? I can't think of any more salient. But well, what, what makes the monument a national monument? Right? So the southern, I don't know much about them, but yeah. <laughs> but I'm south, right, yeah, the, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not really national monuments. Well, right? not, I mean, well some, yeah, sometimes they're, sometimes they're national monuments, and I mean, a lot of these are in play, like, for instance, Mount Rushmore or something like that. Um, but, um, you know, the the arguments of my removalist opponents, certainly as we saw with those quotes, like we're, we're appealing to demographics of the nation and, you know, they fought against America. I mean, this stuff keeps coming up. So it seems like the same in group. Um, right. Uh, Raph, you have time for a good question or you want to pass? Yeah, maybe I'll try. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so you're a sentimentalist. Do you think that our moral constraints, right? Like, uh, maybe you shouldn't offend your compatriots, at least when they have the right not to be offended. Correct. Um, do you think there are other moral constraints, for example, that you should not say embarrass yourself too much or so by um, having a monument for someone who was, who was completely depraved, uh, child abuse or whatever? Yeah, that's interesting, right? So, um, yes, um, like, um, as uh, Alice was pointing out earlier, like, if I want, like, if I have, if, if like, I'm renting out a room in my house, and that's my only source of income for my family, then I do have more obligations to not put up too offensive stuff in my house, because I need that tourism right in my house, right? So and I have more obligations to my family. So that would affect how I how I decorate. Um and um yeah, so so there are many, many moral constraints. Now, yeah. as far as like embarrassing, you know, if I if I entertain, if I have like if I have a cherished uh Japanese friend and uh you know I have some like World War II memor memorabilia, maybe because my dad granddad fought in World War II or something. Yeah. So I was thinking of some kind of obligation you have to yourself, not just to others. Oh, oh okay. I'd say to yourself mm -hmm. not to uh, um, memorialize someone who's really completely unworthy because too depraved or something. Really, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm totally open open to that. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's that moralism. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know. Um, I yeah, I don't know. Um, we, we do, yeah. I mean, so would the Mongolians have like a duty to themselves not to put up? You think you think they're failing maybe a duty to themselves to put up a monument to Genghis Khan? Yeah. Maybe there is difficult questions, but uh, maybe I mean it would be easier to even about say my own case or my own. Yeah, because case. you're uh, being a nice European, but you know you only want to morally judge yourself. <laughs> And morally, let's morally judge the, those Mongolians for a minute. Like, I mean, it doesn't get worse than Genghis Khan, right? So, so like, if if we have a moral duty to ourselves not to memorialize bad people, then how could he escape? 
that it was wrong to put a, a monument to Venus. Yeah. Do you have that intuition though? Oh, sorry. Do you have that intuition though? I mean, do you, do you ever morally outrage how what the Mongolians are like? <laughs> that's yeah. a broader list that we know. I I, 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 think, I think it's far. okay. I think it's okay myself. Um, because I interpret them not as saying, damn it, we want to do it again. We want to kill 50 million Chinese again. I don't think that's what they want. But I do, I, I interpret that monument as saying, well, you know, we're maybe like a fly speck uh, on the global order right now. And, but we want to have pride in ourselves. And we made the foundations of the earth shake at one point the sky you know and we're not we're not so we're not as we're celebrating morally what he did but damn it we want the world to know we have it in us to do it you know and and you know it's rational it's just, it's it's you know it's the rational stuff that brings people together you know and, and instills pride and but i'm interpreting them in that way not as actually you know celebrating the 50 million dead as it were and that's just a um so so um so i i i, I do think i i don't i don't see it as all right, please join me in thanking Ashley. Thank you.